Um, my name is Catherine, um, and I will be the moderator for our talk today. Um, I'm a graduate student at the uh, School of Education, Graduate School of Education at Berkeley. Um, and I'm in the Critical Studies of Race, Gender, and Class cluster. Um, I am very, very excited today um, to be moderating this wonderful event. I already see in the chat that everybody's like, yay, welcome home. <laughs> Okay, um, but before we start, uh, just some housekeeping. Um, please uh, stay muted if you are not speaking. Um, please make sure that you write in the chat uh, for any questions and reactions you might have. Uh, we welcome reactions. <laughs> and um, the, our official event will stop at 2 p.m. today. Um, however, we will, if you want to stay after, we will have breakout rooms open for any networking or questioning um, that would allow for you to also speak to uh, Professor Ann Dyson directly, <laughs> if you would like. Um, okay, um, so just a little bit of background about our Waves of Influence lecture series. Um, as new educational research theories are developed, and new contributions are made. The wave of the GSC's influence grows. The goal of this lecture series is to link those who are new to research with their intellectual ancestors, as well as create and strengthen linkages with ongoing research efforts. For Dr. Judith L. Green, I think she's here, hello, <laughs> um, whose generosity supports this lecture series, those who helped push forward her own scholarship include John Gumperts, Robert Riddell, Paul Ammon, Millie Almy, Her Hermione Marshall, Rob Tierney, Jenica Gumpers, Lily Wong Fillmore, Carl Frederiski, and Leonard Maraciolo, to name just a few. I'm very sorry if I've butchered any of these names. I'm not quite sure of the phonetic pronunciations. Um, Speakers who are invited to give the Waves of Influence lecture are considered critical to the GSE's efforts to develop new perspectives on educational equity, social justice, opportunities for learning, and disciplinary understandings. So we are so excited to have everyone here today. The Waves of Influence lecture series is made possible by the support and scholarship, uh, uh, sponsorship of J Dr. Judith L. Green, um, BA in History 63, Multi-Subject Teaching Credential 63, PhD Education 77. We thank Judith for her commitment to the Berkeley Graduate School of Education and vision for fostering an intergenerational community of inquiry across students, faculty, and alumni. Thank you, Judith. Awesome. So now I am so excited to introduce Professor Anne Haas Dyson. Um, professor Anne Haas Dyson is the Professor of Curriculum and Instruction from the College of Education at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Today, as many of you have noted, is a bit of a homecoming for Professor Dyson, as she was a faculty member at our very own Graduate School of Education for 17 years during which time she received the campus-wide Distinguished Teaching Award. Professor Dyson has spent many years studying early childhood literacy practices through social cultural perspectives. Her research documents the diversity of resources, such as various languages, texts from popular cultures, multimodal, multimodal semiotic tools, and everyday experiences that our diverse school children bring with them as they participate intellectually and socially in school. She illuminates young children's social lives by examining their practices of and play with especially written language and compositions. She recognizes that written language can be woven into children's unofficial childhood practices in ways that coexist with, contribute to, or sometimes even conflict with the official school world. And so she is invested in understanding how diverse children learn to negotiate such differences and establish school as a place of belonging. Among her numerous publications are two Spencer Foundation funded pieces such as Rewriting the Basics, 
Literacy Learning in Children's Cultures, published in 2013, and Child Cultures, Schooling and Literacy, Global Perspectives on Children Composing Their Lives, published in 2016. Her latest book, Writing the Schoolhouse Blues, Literacy, Equity, and Belonging in a Child's Early Schooling, was published just a few months ago in August of 2021. For her work, Illuminating Childhood Cultures and Literacy Learning of Young Children, she has received numerous awards and recognition, including the David Russell Award for Distin Distinguished Research by the National Council of Teachers of English. It is such a pleasure to welcome esteemed researcher and teacher who approaches her work with such compassion and insight for the very young writers of our world. Please help me in welcoming Professor Anne Haas Tyson. Thank you very, very much. I tell you, I, I looked at all the hellos from names, uh, some very new and some so from so long ago that I could just sit here and cry for an hour, but instead, <laughs> I'm gonna go forward. But thank you very much. It does feel like a homecoming, which I wasn't expecting, but it does. Even though I'm sitting here in central Illinois. <laughs> so I want to say that I am honored to be asked to begin the Waves of Influence lecture series initiated by Dr. Judith Green. I met Judith through a mutual friend many years ago. And this friend is someone I now consider my fake sister and definitely an influencer at a critical point in my own decision not to quit what seemed very boring, graduate school. And that person was Celia Ganeshi, who knew Judith from her own years at UCB. They were here together. Celia, as a brand new graduate, took a job at UT Austin, where I was bored in my program and contemplating my next move. And Celia, through what she had learned at this intellectual candy house called Berkeley, especially from John Gumpers and Millie Almy, introduced me to what I would now call linguistic anthropology. This was not boring. And I could see how through its methods, I could crawl into the talk filled worlds of my most fascinating moments as a teacher of young kids, the lively sociality of composing time, but I spent my time with kids who seemed to be disappeared from the writing research of the times, low-income kids and minoritized kids. And so my 40 plus year career took shape. I had no idea at the time that Berkeley would figure into my own career, but I benefited as a grandchild, so to speak, of Berkeley, and I hope I contributed as a faculty member myself. So I'm gonna start my talk today with a little boy. Uh, he's a fake boy, but he's real in, in the ways that matter. And his name is Milo. So let's see if I can have a little luck here and share my screen. I know I should get rid of this, but I don't know how. So can you, can you see it all right, everybody? Okay, so. This is the title, Are You Hot Lunch? Literacy, Equity, and Belonging in Peer Worlds. And I love the fact that hot lunch is often cold. So, whoops, whoops. Let's see, it's not work. Let's see, I think I have to make it. Um, I think, I think there. I'll have to do it like that. Okay, so this is Milo. And Milo is a child who takes a long subway ride with his big sister every month on a Sunday. Now, as the tr subway train moves along, Milo, a black child, feels like a, quote, shook up soda, unquote, a mix of bubbling emotions. To distract himself, he draws the faces of the people on the subway, and based on their looks, he imagines their lives. But when he arrives at the prison to visit his beloved mom, 
he is surprised to see a little white boy from the subway train. He had imagined that child living a royal existence in a castle, but here he is, same place as Milo. And Milo thinks about how a person can't know anyone just by looking at them at one time in one space. And he himself has wondered what people think of him when they just look at him. What do they imagine is his story? So I'm using this book by Matt de la Pena, Milo Imagines the World, to introduce this talk because this talk is about the complexity of reading other people, especially children's reading of each other. I wonder what children think when they look at each other in a particular place. We know that a deficit ideology, adults reading minoritized kids as academic problems is pervasive. So how might this play out, this superficial reading among children themselves in particular places? My wondering was prompted by a small black child named Chavon. In my ethnographic case study, I accompanied him for four years during his journey through early schooling, beginning in his much loved preschool. Now that preschool was very inclusive. It served mainly low income three to five year olds categorized by the school as uh, either African-American like Devon, quote, Hispanic, unquote, white and quote, unquote, mixed. These are the school's categories. The kids themselves embodied their diversity. Some spoke multiple languages. Here's just, a, this is the best I could do. Some spoke multiple languages. Others had culturally marked hairstyles like Devon had braids. Here's Devon, you might as well see him in his self-portrait. You can see he has braids. He drew that when he had just turned five. <laughs> And so uh, they had different ways of referencing kinfolk like Tia and on and on. All classroom media in this class, including books, were culturally and racially inclusive. And most relevant for this talk is that whether they were building with Lego, storytelling, or writing their name, the kids were buried in their resources and they all built on those resources to participate in school activities however they could. If one had trouble, then one practiced, and eventually one could say, as they said, I did it, or you did it. Learning was just a part of living and play, which dominated the day, except for the, pop, the puppet center. These are all facsimiles. Um, it, it was a basic means of learning. Now, this is, as you may know, I'm going to try not to just uh, ad lib, but this, as you may know, looks like kindergarten used to look, but kindergarten doesn't look like this anymore. It's become like a first grade. But then, so the time came when Devon had to go to kindergarten, alias first grade. The school city had a segregated history in which black and white folks lived in different parts of the city with different degree of city support. To try to overcome the cities and thus the schools de facto segregation, the school under the pressure of a consent decree had a plan for using constrained parental choice of desired school to at least lessen the racial divide. With the agreement of the judge that it would help a lot, they put gifted programs in the schools on the uh, low-income section of the city. That would be its own talk. There was a great reluctance for white folks to send kids to predominantly black schools. That's why they did that. Chavon, though, was assigned a place in a school serving primarily a white, relatively affluent neighborhood. He was usually one of two black boys in the class. But racial divides cannot be resolved by just moving children around, especially not by making minoritized kids a numerical minority. Now, this school made much of locating kids on a ladder, an academic ladder of skills 
I can see that my animation isn't going to show up since I'm doing the PowerPoint this way. This is supposed to be hidden over here. The jungle gym. Just look at that ladder right now, if you would, please. Uh, that benchmark, given the push towards ac accountability now and neoliberalism, was very important. The fact that little kids have their diverse learning paths and varied timetables, that wasn't important. That didn't figure in. The overwhelming discourse in the city was about the so-called achievement gap. This discourse assumed an homogenized group of low performing children of color, especially black kids. And of course, certain neighborhood kids have, would have heard this talk. And they seemed to assume from day one that Tavon would need help, that he wasn't an equal, he was on the other side of the gap, and this assumption irritated him. So from Tavon's very first days as a kindergartner, he faced his peers' superficial reading of him, their assumptions about him. And I, as a researcher, but also as, as he called, introduced me, my friend from preschool. I had to pay attention. One kid asked me when he introduced me as, this is my friend from preschool. She said, how old are you? You know, I just thought that was funny. To illustrate how this inquiry arose, I'll bring you into Tavon's first days. Now, from the very beginning, Tavon searched for connections to others. He smiled at everyone. He made friendly overtures. Still, the stiffness of his body as he sat and his perpetual smile raised the possibility that Tavon, like the fictional Milo, was all shook up. Another indicator was his great pleasure at seeing me walk in the door to the kindergarten on the very first day of school. I was the recipient of a tight hug and a whispered, I knew you'd come. I was of no great interest in preschool, but a familiar face in this new space was welcomed. At this time of unease but social optimism, this incident occurred. The kindergartners have gone to a second grade classroom to meet their buddies. Tavon, and it, it's another story, soon figures out that buddies no longer has its preschool meaning of friends to play with. It means older student to help. He was kind of hoping that this new buddy would play with him on the recess, but no. Tavon's buddy, Wyatt, a white child from the surrounding neighborhood, looks at Tavon and says, you're hot lunch. He was, and Wyatt says, I'm cold lunch. Devon said nothing, and I sensed a relational border steeped in institutional history. With the passage of time, I noticed how this relational border was strengthened by school routines. Devon's kindergarten teacher used the distinction as an opportunity for groups of children to stand and be counted. The many bring your own cold lunch kids versus the handful of eat the school's lunch, hot lunch kids. Except for one white child, the hot lunch kids were all the minoritized kids who rode a bus to this out of neighborhood school. Moreover, in the lunchroom, the cold lunch kids quickly sat down, taking seats at the front of each table, which means they'd be the first out the door when recess came. They opened their decorated lunch boxes and got to eating. The hot lunch kids waited in line, sat down last, and thus were the last to go out for the very short lunch recess. As institutional routines and structures became familiar, I could read that lunch episode as a child contributing to a racialized peer border. Wyatt read Tavon's appearance. He had nothing else to go to. He knew, he figured, this is hot lunch. As schooling evolved, related peer readings occurred and reoccurred over the course of the project. It happened all, for, it happened all three years of the elementary school. These were mediated not only by the lunch category, but by, for example, hairstyle. You saw Tavon's braids, girl hair, said some of his peers, peer valued possessions. I wanna uh, show you a big one. Um, 
the uh, water bottle, which makes no sense to me for kindergartners and was not listed on the you must have uh, list, but all the children came except for the kids who getting off the bus with their fancy uh, private water bottles and the other kids use the public bubbler. That would also be another talk, I think, about what's private and what's public. Most significantly was peer judged academic competence, the assumption that Tavon would need help. Related experiences within childhood have been told by very black writers, among them Langston Hughes and W.B. Du Bois. Nancy Tolson refers to these recounts as, quote, racial awakening, unquote, stories at school, or more bluntly, racial reality slaps. They demonstrate how race matters in childhood worlds. This seems particularly so in classrooms like Devon's, ones in which minoritized kids are indeed a numerical minority. Now, when accompanying Devon on his school journey, I was originally interested in changes in how in uh, Tavon's composing and children's composing as they move from a child-centered preschool to a literacy and basic focused kindergarten. However, ethnographic research is never static. As Marcus explains, new perspectives, they emerge collaboratively, including as one learns from but with one's participants. And so it was with me and Tavon, and indeed, so it is with any educator who learns from and with their students. So this became my guiding questions. I wondered how Tavon experienced and negotiated racial relations in childhood worlds. I used the institutional discourse like the achievement gap policies and practices as the dynamic context in which this negotiation took place. And one mediator of these negotiations was childhood composing. So my focus today is on the complexities, particularly of help. Devon's encounter with his new helper, not his new friend, foreshadowed many childhood relationships to come. I want to I'm going to comment briefly on the theoretical tools that guided my work, and I'm not going to say much about methodology, except as I go along, but I'm happy to answer questions about methodology at the end, but I have a long story and I got to keep, <laughs> I got to keep, I, I want to keep on the story, but after I give you my frame, I'm going to highlight selected institutional discourses, policies, and practices, and their consequences for how children might and how Tavon did see how Tavon was seen and saw others. I want to, I'm going to draw especially on the data from the kindergarten and second grade classrooms. I want to show you how racialized discourse, policies, and practices filtered into peer worlds where they were contributed to certain, where they contributed to certain children's, especially the so-called labeled bright children's surface level reading of others. It's not that some children were racist. I hope you don't get that because that's not my point. It's that children are being taught by the schooling institution itself and its discourses, who they are and who others are. My focus is on the institution and its discourses and practices. It is not, it is on the children as enacting them. So here are my major conceptual tools. One is childhood studies, which used to be called the new sociology of childhood but it's very interdisciplinary. So I'm paying close attention to children as social agents who have an impact on their worlds, including their peer worlds. Most of the time, research on children considers them not as full human beings, but as current or future project products of the socializing methods of adults. The interdisciplinary field of childhood studies is fundamentally about the relationship between society's construction of childhood, including assumptions about a normal, 
a good and an innocent child and children's own active interpretation of their worlds. This view highlights how kids appropriate, resist, reinvent, and recontextualize societal structures, including adult discourse about the so-called achievement gap. Remember, the children are listening. I think people forget that. There are kids all over the place, and they listen to what the adults say. It's not irrelevant here that I'm studying in a district which has experienced great white flight to private schools. So let me start with so let me move on now to deficit discourse. I want to say a few words about that. In Devon's district, the achievement gap discourse was pervasive. Its underlying ideology of learning and knowledge is behavioristic. Its rationale rests on test scores. Knowledge is having the correct answer. The children labeled bright have more right answers, especially in kindergarten, about letters and sounds. And this is because as the teacher, the kindergarten teacher told me, the neighborhood parents have uh, networks, they know these tests are coming and they prep their kids for these prep tests. But the, the kids coming on the bus are not networked into this neighborhood. Now this discourse is deficit oriented. It privileges the children who are primed to climb up that ladder I showed you before. As mediated by literacy tests, which happens before or at the very beginning of kindergarten. In Devon's kindergarten, the test identified bright children were all from the surrounding neighborhood, no doubt aided, said Devon, as uh, I already said, Devon's teacher told me that parents networked. So from the beginning of school, the groundwork for the expected gap was laid. Its roots were in the city's history of segregation, but its construction was in the schools themselves. In this project, neighborhood children deemed bright could themselves act toward black children in accord with the discourse of the gap. That's what I'm gonna illustrate. This was so from the very beginning of school when the children had only Tavon's physical features as semiotic material for reading him. Racio-linguistic scholars Rosa and Flores emphasize the reality producing power of white listeners to non-white communicators, and this was visible and audible in Devon's journey. So the last uh, theoretical tool is sociocultural learning. In preschool, the reigning ideology of learning had been that children learn through reciprocal interaction with teacher and peers. Learning is what human beings do at different paces in different ways, we're all learners. In its essence, this is a sociocultural view of learning. In schools, along with learning whatever is entailed in accomplishing an interactive activity, children also learn about social roles and social status, expected actions, the kinds of knowledge that are valued and indeed what human beings are most valued. So if a child is read by certain peers as not smart, then that child may be denied respectful in peer inclusion and events interaction, that is in reciprocal involvement. In essence, that child is being denied opportunities to learn. The dynamic relationship between institutional and official practices, peer respect, which I think is shown in reciprocity, an opportunity to learn was evident in the full case history. Also evident though was Tavon's amazing resistance to this discourse, buoyed by his inclusive preschool, by his closeness to his grandma who taught him about the civil rights movement and about the blues, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but if anybody asks me about Tavon and the blues, I will answer, but I will take him a long time so I'm, I'm gonna to stick to the straight and narrow today, but uh, he was into the blues, this child. Right now, I'm gonna illustrate this dynamic link between institution, the superficial reading of Tavon, and then I'll describe the relational consequences of this superficial uh, reading in these three institutional and practice contexts. And I'm gonna concentrate on the notion of help. So moving right along here, children, reading children, institutional context, 
deficit discourse and the opportunity to learn. So this is, I'm just going to start though with showing you how the kids who considered themselves bright because they were taught that they were bright uh, responded to Tavon. It's imagine this, it's the first day of school. Everyone has by now found their name tag which marks their place in a set of five rectangular tables. Soon the kindergartners will be assigned partners with whom to visit the first day's preschool like centers before the dominant literacy and math centers take over. Oh, I wanted to read you this part. This is what Javon told me after a few weeks of kindergarten. He didn't like kindergarten. He missed preschool, but he did like the writing. He told me that in preschool, you can play inside and out. In kindergarten, you don't play. You quote, you do literacy centers and math centers and you have to learn. We do, we have to learn. So the fun was gone. In kinder, writing happened except for this first day in writing centers organized by his very fine teacher. She was in the institution too, Miss O. There was also a whole class writing time and given responsive companions, that's one place where I saw play reemerge. I'll show you that later. But now let's go back to the first day of school. And they're just about to go into these preschool-like centers. Tavon's partner is a neighborhood boy named Craig. How old are you? asks Tavon. And when Craig says that he is five, we're the same age, says delighted Tavon, trying to find some connections to these kids. The we in Tavon's response is important. Me and Craig, he was saying, we're both five-year-olds. We're both in kindergarten. The search for connections characterized, characterized Tavon's response to others throughout the project. You gotta love this little boy. He's just like, just a really lovable little kid. Soon though, the relationship between Craig and Tavon was repositioned as Craig seemed to assume a position as Tavon's monitor and helper. For example, in the puzzle center, Tavon quickly chose a familiar alphabet puzzle. Alphabet puzzle. Uh, Craig did not choose a puzzle, but he sat and watched Tavon. After a while, Craig began handing Tavon the piece he would need. I can help, said Craig. I want you to help, said Tavon. When Craig left, Tavon expressed his exasperation to me. Why he try to help me? I don't know. Craig was not the only one who offered to help Tavon. Soon, other identified bright children did so as well. For example, the first time Devon was to use a classroom computer, which he had used in preschool, his peer Seth told him, just ask me if you need any help. Now Craig and Seth might well have seen themselves as they were trying to be kind and helpful people. The question is, why was Devon the object of his assumption of needed help, right? That's the question. Why is this coming to him? He just got there. The offering of help to, or the ignoring of Tavon persisted throughout the project. From the first day of kindergarten on, Tavon was situated as lower on the academic ladder by the children who assumed their own competence, even before testing began. Bridget, seeing the teacher, Miss O, helped Tavon with forming the letters of his name as this left-handed child had been using his right hand. He could write his name, but he was, he, he could do it better with the left hand as Miss O was showing him. So Bridget, sitting next to him, turned to Miss O and said, why is he in kindergarten? He can't even write his name. Miss O responded, he could write his name. He was just learning a new way, just like she was. And then she immediately moved over to help Bridget, which did not keep Bridget from telling others that Devon couldn't even write his name. This negative view of Devon's competence started on the very first day of school. So there's a strong sense that the black-white achievement gap discourse pervading the district was playing out in the homes of neighborhood children. Whiteness, economic privilege, and potential for so-called brightness was the ideological norm. Middle-class and affluent white flight in this district was high. Decisions were made, stay in the public school or abandon them for a private school. 
And yet, despite the hopes of school choice, as I noted, white parents were not keen to go from such neighborhoods to predominantly black ones. Before highlighting these institutional practices and their offer and their consequences for peer relations, I want to offer a, a counterexample, a counter narrative, so to speak, of an affirmed Taiwan in peer relations. And it involved a situated resegregation of children, which is very thought provoking. And uh, I'll come back to that. Now, there were kindergartners who never questioned Tavon's competence. Most notable was a small was a small group of children of color, among them his friend Vita, who was a recent immigrant from Iran, whom he assumed was black, and Vita seemed to assume she was too. And Nia, a child categorized as mixed. None of the kids were designated bright. There was a time when they were seated together for whole class, not literacy center activities, including whole class composing. Given responsive peers, these activities could be generative of a new kind of play that could stretch their intentional action, their agency, and their composing. I feel really obligated to show you this, that it was not all doom and gloom. Death is bare bone text. That's too early for that. Just a minute. <laughs> so it's late fall and the kids assignment is to write about a holiday celebrated in their family. Give us a report about your holiday. So Tavan is seated between Vida and Nia. They start talking about holidays as they begin to draw. The children's reciprocity is clear as they respond to each other. They help each other. No child is singled out as the academic leader. Nia, for example, asks Tavon to explain their task again. And later, Nia tells Tavon to put spaces between his written words. Tavon helps both children spell by sounding out a word with them, something he was just beginning to do. When Miss O tells the children to turn to their writing, he writes a straightforward sentence referencing the drawing and talking they have just done. And that was, um, and I was going to show you uh, Tavon's. I am, he make, he's just starting to get the sounded out things. I always want to point like I have a transparency, pardon me, but if you see the me, I me, do you see the me? Uh, he thinks that he's mixing up me and am, which is really wonderful because he's got voice print match now. He learned very, very quickly. I am celebrating my birthday at this, uh, and I am celebrating Christmas. Now that's interesting because Vida does not celebrate Christmas. She uh, celebrates um, Naraz. Nauru's, pardon my, if I'm pronouncing it wrong, a traditional Iranian holiday, but she does do birthdays and Nia is hung up on Christmas. So he, he's very, very smart negotiator. Now, in, uh, so now that they're done writing, they get back to their drawing and talking and they become quite playful. And that playful talking and drawing stretches Tavon's brief sentence about his birthday into a dramatic and very funny story. This is a lousy PowerPoint, but if you look really carefully, you might see on my left hand side, which um, there's a, you see a little figure underneath the table. And on the top of the table, in the middle is a birthday cake with the candle, but on the side is a present and it's teetering on the corner of the table. That's important. So Tavon is drawing his present on a large table with a birthday cake. Nia and Vita each have a large table with food too, and each is drawing people dancing. Nia's people are dancing for Christmas, Vita's for Naruz. Now in response to Tavon's teasing, Nia and Vita, who've had their tensions socially aligned. Nia says, these two are dancing. They're dancing and kissing, says Devon. Nia said, I said they're dancing. Devon, they're kissing too. Nia says, no, they're not. Uh-uh, says Vita, who's very firm about 
gender relations. Javon says, that's my present. That's my present. It's falling down. It's falling down. I want to catch. Oh, no, my present. It came down on my head hard and it hurt it bad. And I had to go to the hospital, says Nia. Yeah, says Javon. And then I got some bones squished out of me. And then I got my bones back in because they grew back in. And then when I didn't have a lot of bones in me, I was flat. Bones don't grow back in, said Nia. Then I'm still going to be flat, says Tavon. Tavon, you always dance with me, says Nia. Then we all dance and eat, says Vita. Tavon and his table mates improvised on their celebratory reports, which became present day play on paper. Their detailed stories did not need the bright children. They needed responsive peers, whatever their identities, and they needed other semiotic tools, drawing, talking, and play to become more detailed in their composing. If the teacher had been free to listen and talk with the children beyond her task of uh, moving around and helping kids with encoding, there might have been a new story to write on the flat birthday boy. Still, in interacting together, the children gain experience telling and semiotically representing their stories. So reciprocal relations and playfulness contextualized an official assignment and thereby infused it with social and cultural meaning. During this time when the children sat together, these relations existed among these children all outside the official bright label and outside those literacy centers where such play rarely occurred. Given the racialized borders among children and the social nature of those centers, I wondered about their consequences for opportunities to participate, to learn. The institutional practices in kindergarten and second grade that I'm gonna focus on are testing, this is the basis for that official label uh, of the teacher, which was bright. B, the designated sitting or the configuration of children, especially the distribution of the bright among the not bright and its ramifications for help. And finally, the official assignment of collaborative projects that all the way through the project in, in a, except for preschool inadvertently encouraged uncollaborative interactions. So now I'm, uh, I'm gonna start with the first one. Confirming helpers and helpies, persistent testing. Now remember that before anyone knew him, certain peers assumed Tavon would need help. And remember that this began when kindergarten began and persisted throughout the project. The district required literacy tests before or at the very start of kinder, and these confirmed the expected achievement gap before anyone had taught anyone anything. This early testing and ranking, and Tavon was ranked near the bottom, made little sense. I wanna say a few words on this while the kids rest for a second off the textual stage. First, as Leaf Green noted, the children notion that children begin school behind doesn't even make sense. How do you start behind? Think about that. When I was uh, first a professor, I'm not supposed to ad lib, this will be dangerous. But I, I just wanna say that when I started at Berkeley as an assistant professor in the early eighties, you know, the state was saying, it's not that the kids are ready for kinder, it's that kinder is ready for the kids. And boy, have we lost that message now. Second, literacy is a complex social activity, a multidimensional sociocultural practice, but the tests have an adult-centric view of a ladder of skills, right? My little clever way of using this is kaput. But children's steps on that narrow ladder are laid out in a series of expected, expected benchmarks so the curriculum was laid out in like five, four week segments or five week segments and kids are supposed to be at a certain point at a certain point in time. But within literacy practices, children will learn different skills on different timelines, following different pathways. 
depending on whatever is culturally familiar context and personally available resources and inclinations, whether they are recognized or not by the institution. In fact, the state guidelines for the preschool had stressed that every child was a distinct wayfarer in preschool literacy practices. Preschoolers progressed up not a narrow ladder, but a more jungle gym-like structure where people started in different places and moved, made progress, but in different ways. The school finally test skills were focused on exactly that, things that you could easily test like timed letters of names and sounds. So teachers are looking at deficiencies. But the thing is, I'm mad living again, that pedagogically you cannot live on, you cannot build on a found, you have to build on a foundation. You can't build on what's not there. You have to pay attention to what's there. That's what you can build on. The preschool teacher knew that. But the minute they get to elementary school, it's their lacks, not their resources. That again, they're contributing to a gap. They're building it. Tavon had a lot of schools that nobody paid any attention to. His thorough enjoyment of hearing and talking about books and even reading them himself in his own way. His preschool-based skill of remembering and comparing characters, actions, and even themes across shared stories. And his intense preschool interest in exploring letters and their links to peer names and beloved uh, objects referenced in books. He loved reading. His favorite thing to read, I think, in preschool was the railroad crossing sign. He learned, he learned voice print match that way. And one day he was so involved in it. And I was watching him and I looked up and there was a whole line of preschoolers waiting for their turn to read the railroad crossing sign. He made it seem so exciting to do that. So this judgment that Javon was not bright, uh, Oh, I want to say that all of these kind of skills he had that didn't show up on these tests actually led to the fact that by mid-year, his kindergarten teacher noted that he wrote better and more than the so-called bright children. That's how she said it. Oh, he writes better than the bright children, which implies that he himself was not bright. This judgment that Javon was not bright did not change among his bright peers either. Consider bright Benji a child very friendly to Tavon during lunch and recess, but who assumed he was the smart one, not Tavon? Listen to this. Benji and Tavon are sitting with a few girls at a round table during literacy center time. The kids are to write words beginning with the letters on chosen cards. And the next card up is X. Noting the letter X, Benji says, oh, nothing starts with X. And Devon says, X starts X-ray. It doesn't start with X. Nothing starts with X. Yes, it does, says Devon. On Cookie Monster Show, it started with an X, but Benny is turned and talking to somebody else now. So Devon turns to the old reliable me and says, on Cookie Monster Show, I watched that at my grandma's. And X, I'd like you to know, does start X-ray. Such interactions with the so-called bright children assuming control continued as Tafan himself continued in school. The bright children may be learning that we are not all learners, that we do not all have knowledge and talent to share. After all, it was they who were asked to read when, for example, classroom and hall posters appeared, which might be named, the, it, it, uh, it was they who could be distributed among literacy centers, which might be named for that child. For example, Caitlin's group. It was they who were expected to write most fluently, not Devon, which is why it was remarkable that he was. There was no sharing time which children could learn of and appreciate others composing. Learning was an individual affair. Nonetheless, Devon generally remained confident in his own competence. A confidence that some minoritized children might not hold on to, as Beverly Tatum has argued. Now, let's go on to the next practice, institutional practices 
distributing the bright among the others who's helping whom. I know I'm smart, Devon told me one day in the second grade, because I don't copy. What, what time is it? 125. And what time do I stop? 140. Okay, all right, moving right along. I know I'm smart, Devon told me one day in the second grade, because I don't copy. That comment speaks volumes about the elementary school's ideology of learning. In preschool, learning was focused on process, on a child's participation in a practice, a interaction with teachers sometimes, and always peers. Every child participated in the process, which ultimately led to those cheers of, you did it, and I did it. But in elementary to the bright, Devon was strictly a healthy. So in second grade, by now, of course, it's the same pattern of distributing the bright children among the others. And his bright child was Dirk. He was sat next to Dirk the whole year. Dirk once said, Dirk also had the top group label. Dirk once said to Javon as the latter child looked through his box of books, the books are to your ability level. In other words, they're not, they're not the same as my books. Such rhetoric seems consistent with Dweck's concept of a fixed intelligence as opposed to a malleable one. A genetic fixed intelligence was used by white elites after Southern Reconstruction to justify continuing to severely limit the rights and liberty of Blacks. This is still operating ideology that echoes in school discourse about low-income children and those of color. In this co and the achievement gap discourse, which I truly cannot stand. In this cultural climate, climate, the helping practice now becomes consistent with a school culture so tightly linked to testing that is to having the right answer. Indeed, in second grade, language arts units highlighting concepts like antonyms, synonyms, and definitions of genre were the subject of unit tests, which results were reported to the district and used for the evaluation of principles. So if in that kind of context, how would children come to help each other? Logically, you get the smart, the so-called bright children or the top group children to give their products with the right answers uh, to others. In this case, no, I didn't see anybody actually ask the bright children for their papers, but they gave them as gifts to nearby peers deemed worthy, but less smart. Tavan got such gifts. Help was a gift, a power play that put the recipient in a needy position. Tavan understood that this was cheating and he never asked for help and he never stopped responding to others in a reciprocal way. He tended to be dismissed when he did so to the bright. Here's an example. On this day, all children had a worksheet task in which they were to cut out each of the box contractions. I'll show you what this looks like. Each of the box contractions in one list and each of the box two word phrases in a second list. Each list seemed to be randomly ordered. On a separate paper, they were to match contraction and word phrase. Dirk was thrilled because he thought up a shortcut one could just cut out each list as is and paste the two lists as they were on another paper and you're done. Dirk showed Tavon a shortcut and expected him to follow his lead, but Tavon did not. He told his seatmate that they were supposed to cut out all the little boxes and then quote, sort them and match them on the paper. No, said Dirk, just cut the paper in half. No, said Devon, you have to match them. Just do it like I'm doing it, said Dirk firmly. And then he went to put his paper in the done pile, the done pile, and Devon went back to his cutting. Devon's belief in himself displayed from the beginning of kindergarten proved useful when his teacher assigned groups for collaborative projects. And it's to that example, the last of this talk <laughs> that I'm gonna turn. And this uh, is to show you this institutional practice of promoting official collaboration, which is really leading to the unofficial assumptions of power. 
And I know Mary Christianakis is here today. I saw her and this, uh, I remember this uh, also from her work when I was here at Berkeley with Mary. Oh, somebody is waiting in, Michelle, Michelle is waiting in the um, waiting room. Okay, that's it. Okay, so um, I'm assuming that the, the kids are not being taught to collaborate, which a teacher I knew in Berkeley, Miss Rita, uh, did beautifully. They're just being put in groups and it's assumed they'll collaborate. So I'm gonna tell you what happened. Javon told me one day that he did like working with other people and I could verify this when he was able to participate as with Nia and Vita in kindergarten. But Dirk and Benji, who was now in second grade, were not prone to allow Javon agency in academic matters. But as it happened, one day his classmate Sonia did, to some extent. A neighborhood white child, she seemed to take her smartness for granted, like Dirk, but she was also conscious of letting others do something, to quote her. On the day in question, Miss G, the second grade teacher, had organized collaborative groups whose assignment was a follow-up to a piece in their language arts text about recycling. The groups were to use Chromebooks. Chromebooks, Javon had wanted to use those Chromebooks. He wanted to look up information. He really wanted to look up information about the blues guitarists he was learning about. But anything with a Chromebook, that would be great. That would be great. And they were supposed to look up information on what could be recycled, and then they were to make posters displaying their findings. Tafan's assigned collaborator, so to speak, were Sonia and his reading group uh, peer, John, an officially mixed child. As I tell you what happened, Sonia's assumed position as a person in charge is clear, but so are Tavon's persistent bids for participation and John's discomfort. So Sonia assumes control from the beginning. She's the one who retrieves the Chromebook from its cart and she takes it to their assigned table. And she's the one who immediately uh, gets the Chromebook working and begins to search for information. As she studies the listed possible sites, Tavon pulls his chair close to hers and listens carefully as she reads aloud the websites. Meanwhile, John is circling their seating, offering constant critiques. You don't need to read, we can all read. Tavon wants to turn with the Chromebook. Sonia obliges and he scrolls down the recycling web list for a few minutes, then Sonia takes a laptop back and when continuing her reading of website names and excited, Javon interrupts her. His voice is louder and higher than I've heard him in ages. Sonia had just read the name of a nearby city's recycling website. My grandma lives there, says Javon. Finally, we get somewhere. Note that we, a collective sense of the group. Sonia clicks on that site, locates the recyclable items, and starts reading the paper items. Wait, I found something. No, I go, go down, go down. It's about aluminum cans. He's participating now. He is. John is still circling, repeating that we can read. Tavon says, we can list the items. We can list the recycling items. Sonia returns to reading the paper items, but Tavon repeats his idea with enthusiasm. We could write this down in a poster. We don't have a poster, says John. We could get one and he pops up. He goes to get a poster and on his way back to the group, he starts moving to an inaudible rhythm. I'm celebrating, he tells me. Tavon writes recycling on the top of the poster. Then Sonia takes a marker and marks three columns, paper, cans, and bottles. And Miss G, the second grade teacher, announces the time is up which Sonia re-says to the group. On his way back to his regular seat, Devon is still dancing. I love that, he tells me, and that is clear. Devon has sought to participate just as he had with others all the way along the way. Unlike John, he was not defending his academic honor. Sonia sat close to Sonia, listening and looking, seeking participation. As educational scholars would predict, Finding a personally meaningful connection to the task boosted his energy level immediately. 
the curricular tax inadvertently became permeable, as I say, to his own interests and experience. That website was for his grandma city. He lived with his grandma much of the week. He knew that recycling, he, she, her grandma, his grandma took that recycling out and the unrecyclable trash. He knew all about that. Wow. Not only did he get to use the tome book for a little bit at least, the website was about his grandma's city. He was part of the we of this small working group and it was connected to a place he knew well. He spoke up with great energy. He wasn't helping in the second grade sense. He was assuming his own reciprocal engagement. He mattered. That's worth dancing about. It's also worth noting that it didn't come about for Tavon without his persistence and the confidence in his own competence. That has survived the schooling experience and the bright kids help. I know other children like John seem to be having a much harder time of it. So now I wanna say something about to bring us to a close toward inclusive classrooms where we all belong. This is one of my favorite pictures. I use this every time I get a chance. I love these kids because um, you can see something's going on. I, maybe you can't see me. Can you see my mark, my little thing if I go back and forth? Oh, so you see these little kids back here, something's happening. This one's a little worried about what this one is doing. This one is thinking it's very, very funny. This one's managing his own mind to see what's happening here. And if I was the observer in that classroom, I'd be right there. I'd be right there. That's where I'd have my tape recorder going. <laughs> I'd be making a few scratch notes. Oh, I'd be in heaven. So now as the clock races forward, I have to conclude my talk about educational discourses, policies, and practices with a few last words. These entities about uh, these discourses, these policies, these practices, they filter how we as educators see or do not see the lively bundle of interests, experiences, energies, worries, and cares that is each child. The theme of this talk was first presented in the form of the fictional but very real Milo, the small child on the subway train who in the end reimagined the pictures he had drawn of his fellow humans on the bus. He didn't know what their lives were like, he said, and they didn't know what his was. Javon's journey into schooling illustrates how inequality can be constructed within childhoods themselves. As those childhoods unfold within the discourses like the achievement gap, the policies like the tight narrow ladders of skills, and the practices of school like the display of the bright children determined by tests. The bright kids were not mean. They were all actually quite lovely children. They can't be dismissed. They were being socialized into a system that limits who they can be too. There's all kinds of intelligences. I meant living for just a minute, but I, I, I had, there was a teacher I observed uh, in the Oakland Berkeley area where I worked when I was here. Her name was Miss Rita. The book that came from the project was called The Brothers and Sisters Learn to Write. And she had an intelligence wheel on her bulletin board. And she talked with the kids about all the different kinds of intelligences and the kind of intelligence she lacked. And they told her, you have to practice, Miss Rita. You got to practice. You'll get it. And that was the kind of mood that conveyed in that room where you did not see this sort of thing. There were lots of ways to be smart and she made sure they knew that. Okay, so I'm gonna get back to this text here. Sociocultural learning in and out of school happens within social relations. A child's opportunities to be seen as competent by their peers and as such to fully participate in opportunities to stretch their competence in new ways are all entangled with belonging, with having respectful, reciprocal relations with others as a part of the classroom community, the we. The dominant events where Devon found such reciprocal learning were with other children of color. They needed to resegregate themselves into a, if they wanted to find that community, they resegregated themselves into a lively community of learners. This happened more than once. And if I had the time, I'd, I'd tell you about another time. There's nothing wrong with finding close relations with those with whom we share experiences. 
who are faced with similar challenges. But if our policies and institutions do not work, if our policies and institutions work against inclusive classroom communities, then we construct a gap. Children appropriate and recontextualize in their own world what they observe in the adult world. So inspired by the fine teachers I have known over the years, including Devon's preschool teacher, I'm gonna offer these practical suggestions for educators, they're brief, they're informed by the teacher's practice I've observed over the years. Most of them were right here in the Bay Area, as I detail in the, in the book I've written. So these are what I think define a community that's going to be inclusive, normalcy of variation in race and class, understanding that race is a social construction, but that doesn't make it any less real as I as you've seen, and class reflected in classroom, especially in talk and text and image, open forums in which misperceptions can be addressed, our collective needs for belonging acknowledged. The best I saw were Miss Louise, the star of the social world of children learning to write the first, the second book I wrote in the Bay Area, and Miss Rita, whom I've already mentioned, who was fabulous. Second, the normalcy of difference in interests and experiences and what we all find easy or hard to learn. No simplistic use of terms like bright or slow, no anointing of the chosen, of the chosen ones. I spent a little while in Michigan. I met Miss Kay and she's one of the stars of rewriting the basics. And finally, the normalcy and celebration of learning. See Miss Sylvia, who did that all the time. She's in writing the schoolhouse blues. As for composing itself, it's multimodal in nature. And so the availability of very technologies and resources matter. The possibilities of children writing together and for each other. I hope I've demonstrated that. I've seen that over the last 40 years. I've never been in a room like the one I was in for Javon. I've always been in very multi-racial rooms and as a formerly low-income kid myself, I have affinity for the low-income kids and I've always worked in such schools. I had never been in such a school. The way the experiences of Javon was a shock to me, which is an embarrassment. It shouldn't have been, I'd read all about it, but I hadn't felt it. And because I love that little boy, I felt it. And finally, playful talk during writing can be critically important, especially if it's followed by sharing times for writing. So now I'd like to close by reading the last two paragraphs of my book, if you don't mind. I was gonna read more than that, but I'm gonna skip to the last three. Uh, Many factors contribute to the educational inequities minoritized children may face, including huge financial inequities when districts are heavily dependent on property taxes. Parent-teacher associations may help individual schools, but that will vary across neighborhoods. In Javon's case, financial inequities were not the focus, although family income differences were always present. Devon's access to opportunities to learn were made challenging by ne neoliberal policies, his test-determined academic status, and the seemingly normalized and racialized gap. Devon had a strong preschool education as well as outside sources of support, including a caring grandmother and a responsive church who provided opportunities for this young musician not all children are so situated. Moreover, of course, my story is just ending. Tavon's is not. I don't know what his future will bring, but Tavon will always be in my thoughts. I hope telling his story has encouraged educators and policymakers to see and hear all their children, especially those children jumped on, lumped on the wrong side of an institutionally created gap until eyes and ears are opened the struggle to belong will continue. The children's struggle is our struggle. So on we go. Thanks very much for coming and for listening. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm done now, so I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs>
sorry that that wasn't a better PowerPoint, but I uh, I couldn't I couldn't figure out how to do it. Wow! Can I just say wow? Can can we all give a round of applause for Professor An and Hastaisen for that wonderful talk? Oh, our camera went off. <laughs> but yay! Wow, I am so blown away um, by that talk. And we have some wonderful questions um, that you all have posed for Anne. Should we just start sharing how wonderful we thought that talk was? <laughs> Does anybody have any insights or you know, emotions that they would want to share? Yes, Professor Judith Green. Um, I see this as one of the most exciting talks I've heard in a long time, but because she brought forward challenges for all of us, and I'm wondering um, how her work could be used as an anchor to look across levels of schooling and past research we've done and see how in this changing time where nothing is predicted and structures are being restructured, perhaps we could use Anne's anchor to add to it from the work of the Berkeley faculty to grad students to other things that could lay a new foundation for looking at the lived experiences of students and teachers in this changing time. That it, I just saw her PowerPoint is raising all of those elements and how my work could be in, informed by and inform her work. Or lead to something I'm hoping that differs so we can understand the opportunities that we're affording learners of all ages. So thank you so much for sharing. Patricia, did you have something to share as well? Oh. All right, so all these buttons to click. Um, what a, um, oops, one more. Whoa, okay, there it is. Oh, what, a, what a fabulous talk. And I echo Glinda's sentiment that this is, of course, we miss Anne's voice and presence at the GSC. Um, and one of the, just following up on what Judy, what Judith was saying, something that this, the talk reminds me um, is Anne's craft and Anne's deep, long ethnographic work um, problematizing childhood and you know, it, and children in institutions and how we receive children in our institutions, but the ways in which children make way, you know, make their way into institutions and that particular rendering of children's worldviews is something very unique and very important to continue to try to understand and represent and and does this work um, in incredible ways. Uh, um, so just just a, a way of just appreciating the the transcript, the rendition, the point of view uh, from children's worlds that is instructive for adults. How much we learn about children's worlds and children's words um, from Anne's work. Oh my gosh, I could not agree more. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I'm not sure if Professor Jason can hear us or can answer this question for us, but I thought given the number of experts and the wide range of expertise that we have in this room, um, I just wanted to kind of piggyback on Patricia's comment and ask about, you know, how has this work influenced um, other uh, professors, works, works and research with um, and learning from children? Um, and how, what kind of advice might you give to the newer, younger generations of researchers um, who might want to conduct the same type of work with children? I 
I can say something to that. Um, Professor Dyson was my dissertation advisor. I'm at Occidental College now. And I, um, in working with her, learned how to do um, childhood ethnographies within schools. And I, you know, I greatly benefited. That's, she was the only person I wanted to work with. And I benefited from having a different view of childhood than I had been schooled in when I was learning in my teacher preparation programs. And I think, um, I think it might be, and now, you know, I do teacher education work and I think it would be so helpful to have some of this enter into teacher education in terms of how we conceptualize childhood and child development would be so useful. Um, and also, you know, as I built my career, it was so helpful to think about concepts of helping because my work was on peer editing work and how parents figure out to helping and how teachers think about parents and what their labor looks like in terms of helping. So Professor Dyson's work has been so helpful to me in particular in terms of reshaping my teacher and teacher education lens. So if we could do anything, it would be to like um, continue to move the discourse into places where there would be more access besides, you know, researchers and have it be more accessible to teachers and practitioners. Yeah. Linda, thank you so much for sharing. Yes, thank you. And I just wanted to chime in and of course, along with all of you say how much Anne's work has meant to, to me over the years as a model of, of generosity and respect in classrooms. And interestingly, as I listened to her talk today, I thought not only about um, her work and the model it represents with, with young children, but how it can represent a model for us, whatever age child we are studying. I was thinking about, for example, um, the undergraduates that I, I currently teach and how important is belonging and the chance to build reciprocal relations with each other and with their instructor for them as well. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Anne, for um, helping me think um, more gener generatively about my current teaching right now. Thank you, Glenda. Laura? Thank you. Yes, uh, I second everything that has been said so far. I will not repeat it. I will add uh, perhaps another uh, takeaway and, uh, and deep um, appreciation uh, with respect to what um, Anne offered today is uh, an affirmation of ethnography as uh, as a you know, valid and humane um, and liberatory uh, approach, one that uh, has been put uh, increasingly under pressure by the neoliberal uh, uh, mechanisms that more and more guide the academic um, um, trajectory and, and, and uh, uh, careers. Uh, so I, I want to highlight that, uh, the, her incredible um, commitment to ethnography and what ethnography can um, yield, yield and, uh, and, um, and such great evidence that uh, it's important to hold on to these uh, uh, labor intensive but so productive and uh, humane uh, methods of inquiry. Gosh, thank you all so much for um, sharing how you know this work on childhood ethnography has added to um, your own research uh, corpus, but also in the, the ways that it can be um, generative for the new waves of scholars as well. Um, another question, um, another question that was posed was how has um, the discourse, the current public discourse, on children falling behind because of COVID? Um, 
how has that discourse affected children and schooling and how might Anne's work um, illuminate and give insight to inform that kind of public discourse that is um, very prevalent today. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Green. Well, Anne's work is um, extremely grounded in um, ways of understanding, not what to do, but ways of understanding. And what we call in my um, work today, the ethnographic eyes on how to step back and see what's new, what's happening, where is it happening? How and in what ways does it influence what students can do, what they can't do? How are they being done? How's that being done across levels, not just levels of schooling, but different positions? How might this inform um, superintendents to what to think about? How might this inform um, different parental groups? Because right now the, the discourse of the divided discourses are not going to listen to just a report. So how does this become a base for helping people step back as we talk about an ethnography to learn from this work questions that we might need to look at and gain a reflexive process from. And Anne's work, like the children's book she showed, and tied back to the work she did with Celia Ganeshi on this, the book she wrote called On the Case, um, and all of the different kinds of histories looking at um, even Miliami's work, which are the roots of a lot of this, as I see it on assessing um, ways of studying the young child, how do we now bring the assessment world into these discourses? Because I am working with a colleague at Ohio U, and that's one of the things we're finding that there are participatory approaches nationally and internationally that could benefit from this kind of dialogue with Anne. Because then how do you know what to look at? How do you understand what's going on? How do you begin to trace that in and out of schools in different contexts to understand, I guess what John Gumpers would say were the linguistic, cultural, social presuppositions that we bring as well as the children bring, as well as the parents. So that's sort of my roots back to the Berkeley days. <laughs> Gosh, thank you so much, Dr. Green, for pointing us to that very charged field of assessment um, and how Anne's work might illuminate that field. I think Professor Anne Dyson is back, yay! <laughs> um, so it, it just, uh... It just did what these things do once in a while. <laughs> that's, that's totally fine. The important thing is that you're back. Um, um, Professor Jason, we were just talking, we were just talking through some questions in a collaborative and helpful manner, um, paying homage to your work. Um, so one of the questions that we were just discussing was how might your work illuminate the current public discourse about children falling behind in schools? Um, during the time of COVID. And Professor Judith Green just told us a little bit. Um, Professor Van Rienen also has his hand raised. Um, so maybe after um, Professor Van Rienen and Professor Dyson, could you speak to that same question? Yeah, yeah. I, just, I just want to um, celebrate um, Anne Dyson. She, um, she was my uh, intellectual mentor and an amazing, um, an amazing um, teacher. And I just want to celebrate the fact that she has made teaching fun and enjoyable and not painful. And you can see it always in her, her presentation. So I, I thank you. But in response to the question, I love what Anne said in the presentation, how do you start behind? I just, and I would just add that, but I'm extremely excited to see you, Anne. So thank you for your great talk. Oh, thank you, Derek. It's fun to see you. Oh, my goodness sakes. <laughs> yeah, lots of memories. So, but 
but I, I have a question I'm supposed to come <laughs> I'm just thinking about Derek and the fifth floor of Tolman and all that stuff. Maybe that could help you um, illuminate the question as well. <laughs> um, Ask me one more time. Yes, sorry about that. Um, the question was, um, how might your work illuminate the current public discourse about children falling behind um, in the times of COVID? Well, one thing I, I would say is that uh, this concept of children falling behind has been there all along. It's exaggerated now, but it isn't as if uh, the notion of some kids being uh, greatly behind other kids is uh, a new is a new thing. Um, but I think it might be it might be an opportunity to first of all because it's COVID and it's not just that they're behind it in their schoolwork, but this has been upsetting for all of us, for us as human beings. And I think it might be an opportunity to think about children as, as complex human beings. They have feelings to express, uh, worries, questions, and I think in going with where children are now, in, uh, in talking with them and observing their play, we can use the tools that we hope to uh, teach in schools to help, to help engage with them. I know I'm not making much sense right now. I think I'm still on the fifth floor of Tolman Hall. But what I'm, I mean is that I don't want the kids reduced during this talk about, oh, they're all behind, to academic anemics, where all we're worried about is, oh, they didn't get to such and such page and such and such book, and they would have forgotten such and such. Mm -hmm. so in the end, we all forget a lot. I think. I think that if we approach kids as the complex human beings they are, if we have the kind of discussions we should have, we need to be having all along, if we give them opportunities to express themselves through literacy, uh, to get away from it all in play uh, or to work it out and uh, to, and to plan that we will make progress together in reciprocal ways, I think it will be all right. I'm not overly worried about the children being behind. I'm more worried about the conception that some kids are always behind. You, there's the assumption that they're behind. I think I worry more about that. Oh my goodness, thank you so much um, for that insight. Um, building on to that, um, there is a question that asked, um, we, you've shared a lot of um, implications for schooling's institutions and policy in your talk um, about seeing children as whole human beings who bring with them diverse um, practices um, and discourses into the classroom that are then recontextualized and re reshaped within the classroom. Um, I wondered if there were some implications for home practices that might also be drawn from your work, um, given that children are moving back and forth between their home and school as, as well as other places. Uh -huh. Yes, and I think we have to make those recommendations with the idea that parents themselves are under a lot of stress right now. And the home situations really very some folks, we certainly saw that in uh, the local area here, some families have lots of technology and others have none. In some of the rural areas around here, they have to drive and find a parking lot. 
uh, outside some institution where they will be able to get online and maybe they're getting online uh, on a cell phone. The, the exaggeration, I mean, not the, the existent exaggerated differences in the kinds of resource, in the kinds of technological resources available to kids was really dramatized for us in this COVID-19 experience. Um, so I think it would certainly depend on the age of the child, but I'm gonna talk about the kids of the age I was talking about. And that's that putting young kids in front of a screen, muting them, and then talking at them for lessons, I can tell you that's a big loser right there. So, you know, they, <laughs> I had a student in my, uh, you know, that qualitative research class, some of you have had, like Derek, all those years and years and years ago, I'm still teaching that. <laughs> um, I know from a, a, a student's project in uh, last year that the students were, the kids were doing all kinds of things while the teacher went on and on so diligently and so carefully. It was ridiculous, but nonetheless, and sad at the same time, so I think we, the kids, I think I would encourage parents to think about engaging children in a, a lot of the activities that they do at home. They cook, they, they, so that involves reading, it involves counting, it, it involves uh, logic, planning, all those sorts of things. We have to clean up. That involves uh, volume, amount. I, I think just daily living is an intellectual exercise, especially when you're tired. So it is for me every day, especially as I get older, everything becomes a problem. And I, I think that um, I would encourage them, I would encourage in the home for parents to first of all, Think of their daily life as something they can share with kids and as the source of interesting places to learn and to do the basics too. You know, even going for a walk around the block, you can count, count the number of things, you can look at the nature of trees, you can talk about the changing seasons, at least here in Illinois you can. And uh, um, I think, I think the idea that the kids have resources that may not be considered as resources and families have a lot to offer and do all the time to their kids. They probably just haven't thought of them as school stuff. I think that's useful. And then uh, now the libraries are open. A lot of the li public libraries are open. And uh, so there are, places to go even if you can't afford books there are places to find books so um i think that's that's where that's the direction my mind goes awesome i i really love how you um noted that you know children have resources that we we don't recognize often as resources and i was just thinking about the the childhood wonder the curiosity that um, a lot of young children bring yeah. um to like what what we consider everyday mundane activities like yeah that's what, walking huh i didn't mm -hmm. start talking too soon what was your last comment oh i was just say everyday mundane activities like walking you know yeah. children could really learn yeah they do they do learn that's a fun um that's a real fun of being a teacher of the little kids because it, they ask constant questions if you're available to that um and everything is fun also it's very easy to amuse them give them a sticker and then <laughs> um 
This relates a little bit back to a question that was posed to the entire audience, um, but we also want to ask you um, whether you have any um, methodological advice uh, for, the, for those who want to become the next child observers and researchers. Well, um, everything depends on relationship if you do the sort of ethnographic work I do. You have to have a relationship. So as uh, those who've had a uh, qualitative research class with me know, I really stress thinking carefully about who you're going to be because the quality of your data will depend in part on the quality of your relationship with the people in the site. So if you think um, about me, think about what, what I had, to, well, actually, even when I was younger, like now, well, there was, there's age, of course, but there's also, um, there's, there's skin color, there's uh, gender, there's, uh, language sometimes there's uh, and there's just a popular cultural world so different from the kids uh, and me always. Um, I remember a project I did at Berkeley and I hired a bunch of students to watch the, this uh, Mighty Mouse cartoon like thing. Uh, it's not called Mighty Mouse but um, Who's the blue little creature? I can't remember who he is. But at, at any rate, they were back there. And, and down in the, I had a third floor office, a little tiny little closet office for research. And I remember that they would tell the people going by the office, we're doing research. We're doing research. <laughs> because I would want them to watch it and uh, give me a running uh, a running tale of all these particular cartoons that I knew the kids were playing or that they had said, or the movies that I have watched, or the way I learned about basketball. I knew nothing about basketball. And the kids were so into Mike Jordan at one time that I had to see and watch it. And I thought, well, it is like he's flying, he's dancing in the air. I, I kind of got into it. And then I had to know football. And I even had an interview with a football, somebody on the Oakland Raiders uh, football team came to talk to me <laughs> at Berkeley. And I told him the stories of what the kids were saying. And uh, did, he, did he ever uh, talk like this when he was ki a kid? And he had actually grown up in the Bay Area and he identified with the kids. And I mean, the things, I try to do everything I can to get in their world. And I try, I've switched. I was first going along the line of um, what I had to overcome. And I do that by not acting like a teacher. I don't go in and say, what, and what is your name? I just learn their names. I just pay attention. And then I'll say, oh, hello, so-and-so. And they'll say, oh, you know my name. And I said, yes, I know everybody's name. And then they think I'm magic, and then I'm not a teacher, I'm a magic, and ask for what your name is, you know, and they get very excited. And the other thing is, when they're talking with each other, I'm quiet. I don't intervene. I, I would never butt into a child's conversation. I might have a question I want to ask, but I'll wait until the conversation lulls. And then I might ask a quick question and stop. So I don't interfere with children's life and I don't become a walking dictionary. I always tell the kids, I establish my role with them and the role is not a teacher. So I tell the kids, I have to do my work. I, I, I have to do my work too. I got work to do too. I got to write down all this stuff. I'm writing down what you do. I, I got to write it down. I'm not showing it to the teacher. I'm just writing it down for me so I can remember what it's like to be in this room, this grade. And then they say, um, I remember Jamil uh, from this is a long ago project when, uh, but I remember him once he was singing All My Darling Clementine at the top of his voices. And the little girl sitting next to him said, will you be quiet? And uh, he kept singing and, and then, 
she uh, she wanted the adult to get him quiet. And Jamil said, is she doing her work? Is she doing her work? Yes, she's doing her job. Is she doing her job to tell me to be quiet? No. And then he went back to singing. And I thought, that's it. He can do what he wants. My job is to write it down, not to interfere. <laughs> and then, uh, so anyway, so I do that. And the other thing I do is I try to get as much as I can in their world. So uh, whatever they're watching, whatever they're talking about, I watch it. I, 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 I go to the, I try to go to the establishments they go to. I try to get familiar so that I know what they're talking about. Um, and sometimes it's just something I wouldn't usually do, but I do it. And then they know me. I even listen to the radio station they listen to because they do still listen to the radio. I know people don't think people do that. I'm a radio person, but the kids, a lot of the kids still listen to the radio to the radios in the home, that radios in the car. And um, so I will listen to what they're listening to. And in that way, they make more sense to me and I make more sense to them because they have assumptions, they read me and uh, they have their expectations and I try to blow them. I know I've arrived when once it was a new, uh, in one classroom, this was the classroom of uh, the brothers and sisters learned to write. And there was a child who came into that, into the classroom uh, kind of in the middle of the year. And one of the little girls in the group I was in at the time was talking about how white people pick their nose. And <laughs> white people pick their noses. And this little girl who had just come in and said, oh, she's white. And, and uh, the, Wanda said, ah, oh, she ain't that white. And then she just kept going. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, good. <laughs> I mean, I was no, no bother, no bother at all. So you pay attention to things like that because you know you're accepted, you're in. And if the teacher comes around and they stop doing certain things and, and the teacher leaves, they go back and you're still there, then you know you're where you want to be inside their world. You're trusted and you don't want to portray that trust. So I don't talk to the teacher in front of the children. I wait till the children leave for something or other. And then I'll chat with the teacher and be friendly and talk about how much I'm enjoying the kids. And if you talk with the teacher about how much you're enjoying the kids, the teacher will be glad to have you. Oh gosh, I just, you know, I'm just getting goosebumps over how you're really helping um, students feel like they belong and they also help you feel like you belong with them. Yeah. Um, and um, I think Professor Chris Gutierrez wanted to share oh, something else. Mine was just a personal reflection and about hi. How, hi, how are you about relationships and how how uh, this has been such a long standing practice of yours. So it's not about research. I mean, I've always understood it's not about research, it's about relationships and really understanding and valuing people that's how I know you and I I put just put in the chat because it's such a true story I used to have to take my son with me to conferences because a single mom and so I'd be in meetings with Anne and other people and Anne would just gravitate to the you know to my son because he was the kid in the room and his x-men comic books and they became instant buddies because she knew everything about these comic books that my son was reading and they had a far more engaging conversation than the adults were having in the room. But I just think it's so characteristic of you and your, and your work uh, and about the reason it's so rich is because you deeply understand and take the time to understand the world of children and all that they bring to it. And I, I just, I mean, I lived it with you personally, but I also see it in your work and I just wanted to comment on it. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. It's very nice to see you. Yeah. And my son is not an adult, but he doesn't forget. <laughs> Lifelong friends. <laughs> yes, it's true. Oh my goodness. Thank you for sharing that, Chris. Um, Soraya. Hi. Hi, Hi Anne. 
I just wanted to say this has been such a treat. I was walking through Berkeley Way West, which is our new home now, and I saw your face on one of the screens and I was like, it was a flashback to 1995 <laughs> when I was in your qualitative methods course as a doctoral student. <laughs> I, it just it's so wonderful to see you and hear your voice and and be reminded of the joy that you bring to this work and um i work with school leaders now um folks who are become teachers becoming principals and wow. your work reminds me that even in such a uh, a job that requires a frenetic pace where the principal's running around and sometimes doesn't get into classrooms, how important it is to pause and take the time to listen to children before making assumptions and conclusions about policies and practices that will impact their lives. So I just wanted to say thank you. I don't really have a question. It's just nice thank to see you. Mariah, and it's wonderful to see you after all these years. Yeah. Gosh, this feels like such a wonderful, warm community. Um, and I'm so, so grateful that we were able to have Professor Anne Hoss Dyson join us today. Um, I don't want to take too much of everybody's time. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Anne, for coming with us and you know sharing your wonderful insights about children's worlds with us. Um, and we hope that we will have a next time um, to be able to hear about Tavon and the Blues. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That kid can sing. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Judith Green, for helping to organize and sponsor this event. Yay! Thank you, everybody, for coming and for understanding the technical, di the technical difficulties. <laughs> you made me feel really comfortable. I didn't know if I was going to feel awkward or what. Because, you know, Berkeley was home for so long. Uh, but this was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.